This episode of the Troxel Podcast is made possible with support from Arc IT. Are you tired of standard IT services that miss the mark? Choose Arc IT for specialized, proactive IT management, BIM support, and robust data security tailored for architects. Whether you're a team of 10 or a growing firm of 50 plus, Arc IT understands the architecture industry and will empower your unique creative vision to enable you to do your best work. Embrace a technology team that enhances, not hinders, your design process. Visit getarcit.com for your free IT assessment and start transforming your firm and your tech experience today. That's G-E-T-A-R-C-H-I-T dot com. Welcome to the Troxel Podcast. My name is Evan Troxel. In this episode, I am joined by architects, entrepreneurs, and technologists Andy Robert and Mercedes Karakiri. Andy is a professional architect from ORT University in Uruguay, and she lived in Germany and pursued graduate studies in Dessau, where the former Bauhaus was located. Today, she is the CEO of Slantis, co-founded in 2016 with her lifelong friend, Mercedes Karakiri. Mercedes is a licensed architect and entrepreneur specializing in innovation and technology, she received her degree from the Faculty of Architecture Udalar in Uruguay, and she studied at the ENSAG in Grenoble, France. Additionally, she graduated specializing in digital fabrication from MIT's Fab Academy. After working at Jean Nouvel's studio in Paris and leading multiple developments in Montevideo, she co-founded Slantis in 2016 with her lifelong friend, Andy Robert. Today we discuss their journey that led to the inception of Slantis, their focus on technology, parametric architecture, and BIM, the transformative aha moments that define their company, their mission, the importance of collaboration, company culture, knowledge management, and their ambitious goal of changing the architectural industry for the better. We also chat about career obstacles, the challenges with the industry's entrenched hourly billing system, and the need for innovation and better project management. Before we jump into today's conversation, please do me a favor if you have not already done so. If you are a regular listener and are enjoying these episodes, please subscribe both on YouTube and in your preferred podcast app to let me know that you're a fan. It really, really helps. Go ahead and do that now so that you don't forget because this episode will be waiting right here until you get back. So now, without further ado, I bring you my wide-ranging conversation with Andy Robert, and Mercedes Karakiri. Today I am joined by the co-founders of Slantis, Andy Roberts and Mercedes. How do you say your last name, Mercedes? I do not want to mess it up, and I know I will, so you say it before I do. So I'm going to say it in okay. Spanish and okay. in English. So in Spanish it would be Karakiri. And in English, it would be carry query, no. which is much more easier. That is that that just feels like a like a yeah like a sine wave. Going to, okay, I don't I don't even wave. know if I could repeat that. But we we had a conversation before we have are having this conversation about how we can't remember names, and I said when somebody tells me their name, it just it's gone, just gone. And and so your last name, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> you can call it Mercedes. All right. Well, welcome to the show, both of you. It's great to have you here today. Thanks for the invite. Thank you for having us. Well, let's let's start off with just kind of the origin story of Slantis. And I mean, you you guys have been friends for a very long time, right? And so, Andy, maybe you can you can start off and just tell us the origin story of your relationship and how that came to become. Slantis. So the origin story goes uh, back to 2005, I think, something like that. Um, so uh, one of um, my friends from childhood, she was at my school. And then uh, for the two last years of high school, she changes schools and went to Mare's uh, high school. So at some point, those two groups kind of merge and we created like a larger friends group, which is still rolling today. Uh, so we are part of the same uh, friends group since teenagehood, All let's right. say. Um, so 
At that point, we already connected because of the larger group. We were the only ones studying architecture early on, different schools, but uh, both really interested in art and both really interested in kind of like a global perspective. Um, when we entered architecture school, we were talking a lot about the different perspectives on how architecture was being studied and taught and else. And at some point, we both uh, went abroad to Europe to study and continue our studies there. So Mary went to France and I went to Germany um, to a former Bauhaus. And Mer went to Grenoble, which it's impossible for me to pronounce in French, but <laughs> she you can it. say it. <laughs> um, and at the same time, so we were both in Europe at the same time and kind of figuring out what, what was the buzz talk of architecture back then. This was like 2010. Uh, and there was a lot of conversation about parametric architecture and uh, how to use some certain tools to bend geometry. Uh, tools like Grasshopper and else. Um, so then we returned to Uruguay a few years afterwards. We returned to Uruguay and then we kind of both um, started working in different career paths. So Mayor became like a senior project manager, uh, developing really complex projects at a very early age in a very uh, well-known architectural firm, international architectural firm here in Uruguay. And I worked for a while uh, on-site, so I was leading on-site work, again, like a very early uh, age, uh, which was definitely challenging being a woman and uh, being on-site and just leading the uh, construction efforts. And then I decided I didn't want to be at the construction site anymore. Uh, so I uh, got a job in uh, an American company here in Uruguay that was doing master planning and design of multifamily residential buildings. Um, so at that point we were all the time talking, like again, we were still friends and we had a blast in, in those years. It was fun, but at some point it wasn't. Like we were coming from Europe and we had all this knowledge acquired and then the market here is really, really small. So we would figure out, okay, let's do something to kind of expand our, our horizons and the tagline at that point. So we got together at a coffee shop and the tagline there was, let's work for the United States. <laughs> the, <laughs> that the was US. the tagline. Yeah, all of it. <laughs> uh, and we didn't know anyone. Mm. Uh, we were both coming from Europe again. Mayor is like, by, she's traveling well, but bilingual first in French and then in, in English. I'm bilingual uh, in English as a second language. So why uh, United States? Because I had acquired some of the knowledge working for the American company. And then we figure out that it would be the place where it would be uh, open enough to receive us. And it was a bit more exposed to what we had to offer, which at the beginning was really very basic uh, drafting services. Yeah, and, and it was a big market. And so it was a big it was market. A big market. It was um, a, a language we both spoke. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it, it was pretty logical, like within the context of working for the US, whatever that means. Yeah. Uh, but it was pretty log a pretty logical next step. So like time zone wise, oh, yeah. um, language wise, yeah. um, and he had a lot of, of knowledge acquired on the uh, multifamily sector. Um, so, so well, so I Mercedes, sense. what was that kind of aha moment that that Slantis came out of? I mean, why did you guys get together in the coffee shop that day and decide to start a consulting business? Slantis is a continuous uh, roller coaster of aha okay. moments. <laughs> Uh, I'll try to pick a couple of aha moments along our story. Um, so I think the first one was, the first aha moment was um, getting together in a coffee shop and understanding we wanted to do something else. Uh, as Annie mentioned, we both had like pretty interesting paths, uh, but we both agree like from different perspectives and different edges that we wanted to do something else uh, than what we were doing. Um, so the first aha moment was let's do something international uh, from Uruguay, or at least let's start from Uruguay doing something international um, in relation with architecture. 
the, then the another aha moment um, timely organized would be would be understanding that we started doing um, anything or, or everything um, CAD um, SketchUp I I don't like SketchUp um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> in design so, for presentation don't like presentation just like whatever you need we're here and ready to work for us so basically whatever was us and architecture related and architecture is kind of vast we were doing uh so another aha moment was um saying we're not going to do anything um that is not revit based or bim based so it was first revit based um, th there was a client, so we got introduced to Revit and, and technology in general from many edges. One of them was a client wanted to do Revit, uh, and we decided to jump in. And after that first project, we decided we we're not going to do things um, in, in other software. Uh, so, so that was another aha moment that paid off a little bit later. Then another aha moment was understanding that our former name uh, was horrible and we decided to become Slantis <laughs> because uh, it was more representative of what we wanted to build and what we were building. Uh, so our former name was Arc Sourcing, Arch Sourcing, Arch Sourcing, uh, and there's, there's infinite <laughs> ways to pronounce it and right. it's infinite and horrible. Right. Uh, so that was another moment. Um, and then, and then I would I would say like the the current aha moment is um, maybe maybe understanding that um, our biggest competitors somehow uh, this is going to be strong but uh, but I believe it um, is is that our our biggest competitor right now is apathy um, and and um, understanding that we really are in a position so the journey we've been we've been through and the point in which we are today um it's it's a very influential one and one that will allow us and allows us like to keep changing our industry for the better um so i think i think our current aha moment is understanding that what we thought about uh at, at that coffee shop which back then was just like let's do something else we're not getting paid enough uh, Turn, turn into the vision of really changing the industry for the better and, and, and helping our community to make that push and make that shift. Um, there's, there's a lot of things like in, in, in between that, that that got us closer to technology, closer to a more um, forward thinking mindset. Uh, but I think like where we are right now is, oh, we really have the power to change the industry and and we're here to do it that's it really interesting that you say that the, the biggest competitor is apathy and and so i definitely want to dig into that what what do you have andy do you want to do you want to mention something there i wanted to add um kind of the um, uh, what kind of like shows the whole aha moment mm -hmm. are how we position in front of certain situations and that is replicated towards like our whole journey. And I would say there are like three or four ingredients that we always talk about. One is a boldness. We are kind of really bold in um, how we position in front of certain, uh, just like saying we're gonna be working for the United States and um, we are 6,000 miles away um, and it's just like imagining you being from like right now sitting in the United States and saying, okay, I'm going to work for South Africa. And you basically don't know anyone. So so that first, at some point we, uh, we started working with certain friends from the industry. And at some point we uh, understood that we needed to learn how to sell, which is a whole different skill set than architecture right. itself and kind of uh, building a business and uh, that was that was even a conversation, and we said, okay, to in order to understand this, we need to take a plane and go to LA, which we'd never been, and we were already doing doing work there. And that was a Wednesday conversation, and on Thursday we were uh, up the plane towards LA, where we've never been before. 
Um, so, so boldness, I would say, is one of the of the things that kind of sows the whole the whole aha moments. Uh, another thing is kind of risk taking, which is very hand in hand uh, with with bold and really understanding risk as an opportunity and a way of growing. And then we are obsessed, and I think this is ap applied to us. And I don't know if you call it nerd or whatever. Like we are obsessed with learning and. Uh, understanding new stuff and talking to a lot of people and uh, to whoever we can talk um, w or uh, if we can reach out to uh, as many people as we can and then learn and extract th that information that is like precious gold mm -hmm. for us. Uh, so we've been from the very beginning really obsessing, really understanding in depth um, everything that we are um, working on. And I think that kind of... Um, it's the constant between all the aha moments over time. Which is a horrible obsession to have because you never, you know, you never know enough. <laughs> so, like, we just like, talking and give me everything you know right now. My wife is, my wife constantly <laughs> is saying, I, I, she just wants to know everything. She wants to know everything about everything. And it's, it's just like what you're talking about. It's like this insatiable drive to yes. learn as much mm -hmm. as possible and experience as many things as you possibly can during the life that you're given and the, the conversations that you're having and you're always trying to get more, try to go deeper, try to get more out of that. And that really does lead to a, a, a in-depth understanding, I think, of the, the things that you're, you're going after. Yeah, the, there was a time, like I have a personal aha moment. Uh, there was a time in which I got mad at architecture. Um, not because I don't like architecture, I'm really passionate about architecture. Like I, I wouldn't be able to do something that has not to do with architecture and art and creating. Uh, but, but there was a time in which I got mad and, and, and I understood that I was mad not at architecture, but at the way of doing things. Um, in architecture, yeah. so I kind of stepped aside, um, studied digital fabrication at MIT, and my constant reaction was like, how are these people doing these things like this, and we're yeah. not? And <laughs> and again, and again, and again, so like... Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, and so that gets it, back it to your broke. apathy comment, I think, right, which is, and, it, and it's not that people, everybody in that I've, that I've talked with on this podcast, people that I've worked with for years and years and years, everybody wants to do a great job. They don't even want to just do a good job. They want to do a great job. Yeah. And yet you still see like the approach to doing a great job is often very broken, right? And I think that's where that apathy yeah. that you're talking about comes in, which is just kind of like accepting the way things are and not striving for a better way of doing things. I, a lot of the people who come on the show, it's, it's all about the how, how do we do this better? What are the workflows? What are the yes. tools? There's a lot of focus on tools. The fundamental problems are, are not the tools, right? And, and the tool right. adoption is just a symptom of these larger apathetic problems, right? And so I'm curious from um, your guys's point of view, I mean, you're talking with firms all over the place and I'm sure that there are themes and trends that you see and and mercedes your, your whole getting mad at architecture i i joined the club right like this is you you feel like you're you feel like you're pushing boulders uphill because like change is so difficult and i know a lot of people listening to the show they feel that they feel that deeply right and everybody's looking for ways in which they can affect a better outcome in a positive way they're not doing it just because they want to use technology. They're doing it because like we are the designers of the built environment that affects everybody 90% of their day everywhere. Right. Yeah. And so like, that's why. And, and so to kind of steer the conversation or the ideas around this conversation around why we do what we do. And then you kind of work backwards and you figure out how you're going to get there with the tools and with the workflows and with the workforce and the, the staffing and the scheduling and all of those things. Like you really have to set those values, those the vision for like why you do what you do, and and you guys have an amazing culture at Slantis too, and I, I it seems like that permeates through everything that you're talking about this this insatiable curiosity, the drive for risk taking, you you yeah. you you're striving to to hit home runs, like you have these audacious goals, 
And, and it sounds to me like this is all kind of weaving together in, in your story. Yes. Um, so I would add there that maybe it's from our kind of entrepreneurial background that, and from not only being architects, but building a company, which is curious, that is the same word, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that um, we realized very early on that people are the foundations of any successful organization and the systems and processes and even tools that you put to the service of creating an organizational culture that helps push to the next level whatever you're trying to change is what sets the ground for success or not. And we've experienced this firsthand from improving our and us being obsessed in reading, I don't know how many books about hiring and how you get the best talent. And the interesting thing is you don't have to reinvent the wheel for this. There are a lot of uh, literature and information around but there. But you're talking to architects. Uh, they usually architects want to want to start with a blank page, and and to our detriment, exactly. to our detriment, we take on too much, and yeah. we don't look at other models and other examples to apply. But what you're saying, I think, is is completely true. That you you took yet, the words out of my mouth. Like, and yet, like it's exactly that. All buildings <laughs> and all pieces of architecture, like even if you start from a blank page you do have a certain amount of available materials to build right. to build right. with. So like it's fundamentally like wrong, like the, the basement is fundamentally wrong. I'm not talking about like very artisty and custom made pieces of architecture, right. uh, but just like for like the, the majority the vast majority of what's built, like you never start from the components you have whether if it's a brick, a jib board or whatever, like you, you forget completely about the reality of the world and start with an abstract exercise, which is fascinating and, and very fun to do, uh, but, but very inefficient. Um, so like, and, and, and we see that like everybody starting from a blank canvas at every single project, uh, no matter if there's a template somewhere in place at some <laughs> corner or drawer or, or, of a firm, uh, we, we really are um, dissipating a lot of energy um, every every time we start a new project and and and, and nobody think it's alarming um, so that's what really that's what really impressed it like nobody think it's alarming and like culturally if you you take a look at other industries I I, I just imagine like a team of engineers trying to start a bunch of code without any library in place or without any function in place. Like they would say, like, no, I'm not gonna right. do this. I'm not. <laughs> right. I'm not gonna they just do this. Wouldn't put up with it. Uh, right. <laughs> but 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 our, like you would you would get to know. Like if you hang out a little bit with a couple of engineers, they would say like, I'm not. I'm not gonna call this. Like no. So it, and, and it won't happen in architecture because because we're okay with yeah. it. And if we're okay with it, like why people won't be okay with it if the person you're looking up to is okay with it? Right. Yeah. Right. This episode is made possible with support from Avail. Avail makes the best software to manage all of your AEC digital content. Dedicated to developing tools that save AEC teams time, Avail has now added Revit application version management to its suite of content management capabilities. Once a painful manual process, Revit application versioning is now automatic for Avail customers. Publishers simply upload files to an Avail channel, and the files are automatically converted to newer versions from Revit 2021 through Revit 2025. For users, the experience is then seamless. They can search, select, and utilize the Revit content in Avail, regardless of what Revit version they are working in. Inquire about a demo of Avail and its new Revit application version management features today at getavail.com slash request dash demo. My thanks to Avail for supporting this episode of the Troxel podcast. And now let's get back to the conversation. Through our journey, what we've seen is this is on the right side. I'm like a, a true, too optimistic of a person, <laughs> but um, architecture is one, for me, one of the most amazing careers. And we are through an, like our entrepreneurial journey 
talking to a lot of other people from the, the technology industry and engineering and uh, chemistry and just so many other industries that we're exposed to through friends and uh, other 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 business uh, business owners and and founders and uh, what well, we would encounter and I was talking to our to Maddie our marketing manager about this because she her background is in industrial engineer. I do think that careers that have the power of imagining things that don't exist in the real world and then materializing that are going to be the true game changers moving forward because all the rest is going to be done through chat GPT and AI and else. Mm -hmm. So architecture for me is kind of misutilized, I don't know how you pronounce that correctly. Um, we were we were having this conversation when we were designing our uh, organizational structure on how we organize ourselves. And we said, okay, we have this skill set coming from architecture. We know how to, we know the process of creating something from scratch and really understanding what's already in place and talking to other people. So let's use the same process of creating a building, but then apply that to organizational structure. Um, and that's why I think architecture is amazing. Like you can really apply the skills yeah. that you learn through school and then through your career life in other realms where I think architects are not actually seeing right. that or are not using that to their advantage. And usually it's what Mary's saying, like they try to reinvent and, and instead of, of seeing that as a superpower. Yeah, and there's a little bit within, within our personal mission too, I would say, of claiming back the profession uh, and, oh, you're an architect, like instead of you must draw pretty sketches, Oh, you must really have a... a, a <laughs> there, there, there was an Instagram video going around where somebody was just out on the street with a, a microphone asking different people what architects do. And the answers were just like that. It was like they draw pretty pictures. They, they draw pretty little sketches. There was nothing about oh, no. like shaping the built environment. There was nothing about... There was nothing even about the buildings that people inhabit, right? It, it was just like they draw... Yeah. Yeah. So claiming it, I think that's a really interesting. It's like staking your claim and taking architecture back and really talking about the value that it provides to society. And everybody uses yeah. these things all the time there. And they, they have the biggest impact on global economies and every all the business. Everything operates out of these things that, that we have dedicated our lives to producing. And, and so it's it's kind of sad to say that we have to take this back that we have to claim this right yeah yeah it's it's an incredibly complex profession uh and train of thought that you need to build a building mm -hmm. and and if you see if you see like if you see people that build machines um like it's the it's the same reasonable logic you have you need to have in place like all the components and all the electronics and to make it work and what so it's exactly the same, like a building, it's a machine or like the human body or like what, whatever that, that functions on its own under different circumstances and contexts and whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, so the, the, the abstract capacity, like right. it's, I know you're almost a mathematician, you know, yeah. like on the geometry side of things, on the simulation yeah. side of things. Um, so, so I think our, our, our mission also has to do a little, a little bit with that. Um, and just help or, or push rather than help like the world to reshape and, and rewrap our heads around our profession and how things need to be mm -hmm. done and staying, staying really far from um, that doesn't work in the real world or we have always done it like this. So like that's the worst thing you can take for, for granted. Yeah. The, the idea that, that you talked about earlier about applying your design skills to the organization or the business model yes. or, you know, like all of these things are design problems, but there is kind of a blind yeah. spot to that. And I'm sure working with a lot of different companies all over the place, again, you're, you're seeing that over and over again. How are you starting to change? Yes. Well, you're having conversations with them, and I assume, best case scenario, you are changing their perspective on that. And so, I'm just curious, kind yeah. of how how you guys are doing that. Like, what kinds of what kinds of words are you using? What kinds of stories are you telling 
to break through that barrier. So even how we set up our, so uh, let me tell you a brief story that happened to me yesterday. Uh, so we were having a conversation, a uh, kickoff meeting with a cli like new client, right? And um, there was, so we are a service mm -hmm. business. So Slant is a service business, but then architecture in general or architects is a professional service business, right? Um, so we had this kickoff meeting where on our end, there was a, what we call two teams. One is a client partnership team, and then the other one is the production and architectural development team. Um, so on the partnership team, there was we have a client success um, and collaboration manager that is helping through the whole process of collaboration. And she's an architect. She used to be on the production team, and now she's on the client success end. And uh, and then you have a pro on on the architectural team. You have a project manager, project architects, and all that are going to help through the uh, construction document side of our client. And um, at the end of the of the kickup meeting, they were in shock. They were like, "I've never heard about a client success person and being an architect. How does this go?" And we brought that from the technology world. Like we had a conversation and the technology people are also providing services at a much higher level than we are. What can we learn from the organization system that we can bring into architecture? And at the beginning, we were really scared because we thought architects are not going to be um, receiving this property or they won't understand how this goes. And actually, through rolling it, we figured out that they were really grateful for it. And it's basically someone that is taking care of of your whole process of the service all the time that we are collaborating. And that small shifts are major compounded over time. Uh, so we are trying to do that and figure out how to do it differently in everything that we do. Um, so. From that story for me was like kind of eye opening or how <laughs> they were even telling us like, oh my God, like you're so much more organized than we are. You're so much like, uh, um, yes, just like you, you uh, we want to do this with our own clients. And that there is when change happens. Um, yeah. So, so sorry, sorry, Mer, go, go, go ahead. So, um, I, I was um you you made me think and and Evan questions made me think about like little things that I think we bring to the table and and yes. generate a doubt at first and then a need to understand and then an action so like our our services like we have two main lanes so one targets the project and the production of a project. Uh, so our focus there is the project and the other one, which is a consulting one, targets the mm -hmm. firm um, and the firm as a whole, like more in a system processes and workflow level. Uh, and things that we've been bringing to the table on, on those lanes are uh, one, merging architecture and technology. So um, I think it was our first Autodesk University that we attended that we realized that a PA at Slantis would have the same level as a BIM manager in the US, let's say market. And and we did it that way because we just needed to do it that way and we understood it was a way to go. We were like lean and needed to have like versatile people and stuff. Uh, but like there was no division for us, just like, oh, you need to understand the whole thing as a whole and then build expertise as a subject matter expert in different areas. But like something we bring to the table a lot is bringing architecture and technology to the table together yeah. as we understand like technology is not Revit or BIM, it's just like any new and better way of doing things. And if you don't and if you don't address our profession from a technological perspective, like no matter what tool you're thinking, like you gotta understand how the world works. And today you cannot do that without understanding the basics of AI. So if you don't if you don't approach it, approach it that way as a, as part of the discipline itself, then it's very hard to stay up to speed. Yeah. Uh, so like, yeah. just like putting that as a, as a part of the agenda, not a, not like f 
for the CIOs or not for the technology people and bright minds. So like if we don't embrace that as architects, then and, and people tend to do that. Oh, like she's in the technology side. Oh, she's the technology yeah. brain. And it's like, well, I think we're all pretty much technology savvy nowadays. Um, so, so it's really our, our duty to understand how things work, um, not necessarily technically, but in an abstract mode, um, as, as we do with architecture. Um, so, so that's definitely one thing. And, and a couple of, of more things that I think we, we really help our clients to address differently um, is like the management of knowledge. So as a service company, your people are the most important thing. Um, and, and on a second level is the knowledge you have, which which cannot only live on people's brains, uh, because if not, you're you're not as strong as you should be. So like managing knowledge of a firm on on different planes, like not only from the detail library you have, but from the documentation. So we have a very um, strong obsession with documenting. We stole that from the software industry, of course. So just like um, trying to materialize what we know and to, to generate a culture around getting tangible knowledge, not only harvesting after every project, but committing to improve that to every workflow in the company. So I think, so I think um, architecture firms are not really focused on that and, and they don't create the right. room uh, that, that it that it needs yeah. to have like I'm speaking yeah. on a general rule as a general level that like there's very bright people tackling this but uh, but that's something we really bring to the table and 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 it has proven for our clients to be a game changer because you don't need to invest a lot of money uh, you just need to to tweak let's say some some ways of doing things to start harvesting what you know and materializing it and, and it's part of your intellectual property as a right. company too um, yeah, I mean, when, when you talk about that specifically, you're talking about taking the time after a project to do the debrief and capture it to make it available to everybody else. But the mindset is next project. That's the mindset, right? That's the, that's the current flow that you're trying to swim against, which is this project is done. We have another project we need to go do now. We don't have time to use that intellectual property that we have built throughout the life of this project with the individuals who are on the team who worked on it and capitalize on that on the next project. We, if, and, and architecture is, is a bit different than other industries in that, at least in large offices, teams disperse and a new team forms. It's not the same people, right, who move from one project to the next typically. And so if you, you might get bits of progress that move forward in very different ways because that you have a new accumulation of people on a new team and you have new dynamics and you have a new scope for a project and you have all these new constraints, which everybody's constantly trying to understand as they ramp up on a new project. And so there's like you're talking about like this wastefulness that happens because you cannot capitalize on what happened before as well because you're not taking the time making the room as you said right to ca to capture that information and put it somewhere to then gain insight from at a at an organizational level and that is intellectual property and we squander it yes and and i think like we usually so here here's an interesting conversation i've been having with my son for a while, <laughs> which is, which is, I think part of the problem is the way we measure um, the, the success of a project or the production of a project, because if you reuse a lot of stuff, like it's like the footprint of the production of a project, like even when you buy clothing and you just like take a look at the linen for it to be recycled at least, or just like understand like the thing as a whole, like if we could measure um, the time we gain recycling stuff from other projects, from online, from whatever, then you could or you should be able to charge more because like you've created something you've used for the project, then I mean, you're going to, to charge it for it. Like even if you haven't right. built it for that project. 
Um, so like instead of measuring like the amount of hours a project took or 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 the, the, the amount of time a project took or manpower or whatever, then what if you could measure the amount of recycling you did for a specific project? Uh, because that that would change that would change the equation and it would change like what you're measuring. Uh, and instead of focusing on what you produce from scratch, well, try to focus the amount of hours you've mm -hmm. gained because that would give you at least a sense of if you're if you're doing part of your job right or not. And on a different vein, and and going back to what what you were saying, Evan, um, about uh, the teams kind of being reorganized every time a project starts and then every time a project um, stops and then starts um, something that I think we should uh, be doing more is uh, and going back to our conversation about culture and the people aspect of our business which is usually not uh, at the center of the conversation uh, is building like real collaboration tools I think this has kind of accelerated through uh, the remote work that we are all doing right now uh, but like Every time you start out uh, working with a new project or even team, you should be able to set the grounds on how that team is going to be operating, how uh, that team should be counterbalancing strengths and weaknesses from each one of their members, really understanding how to communicate efficiently and properly, uh, really understanding what is expected from everyone. And usually there are different things and it's not... Uh, because of different levels of seniority, you're expecting different different things from different people. So all of that kind of like, um, let's start a team, let's start a project where we're starting a new team and setting those grounds to make it successful is usually not being addressed at all. Let's just start working in the project and we need to deliver and deadlines, 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 but then the success of those deadlines is measured and <laughs> to what Mira was saying should be measured also on how successful the team is collaborating yeah. between them um yeah and we're not used to do work about the work we just go and do work on pr the production side but like th there there's a time in which you do work about the work yeah. that will be carried right. on i mean the the, um, the way you say that is going slow to go fast right the going slow part is the important part that comes first and because Going, then you're all on the same page and you have the right tools and you're doing it the way that has been decided, then you can go fast, right? Like that's the idea behind yeah. that. Yeah. 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 So internally we have, so we have several projects that go like, uh, on the tangent. Is that an actual word in English? Yes. It, is, it is like that. <laughs> the tangent. Okay. <laughs> I, I, think I was spanglishing it. Uh, uh <laughs> Uh, the dungeon that go uh, besides the work that we are doing for our clients and um, we have we name them like on a funny way uh, so we have one sort of projects that are called uh, and what they would be the infrastructure projects we, which we call them the pool projects and uh, we say we are building the mm -hmm. pool and then the other pro set of projects are the diving uh, projects so you need to dive Oh, you can dive once you already have the pool built. Mm -hmm. uh, so the bigger projects, infrastructure-wise projects, uh, mid-long-term projects, slower but smarter mm -hmm. projects are, are those pool projects. Mm -hmm. But then they are they are allowing you to jump safely when you are diving. When there's water. Yeah. When there's water <laughs> in it. Uh, I, I thought you were going to talk about our, our support projects, which need to be renamed to a more fancy name, but <laughs> we do have... So something we, we stole from the, the software industry and just technology industry is having not only our client projects, which are projects on the production side or the consulting side, but support projects that are internal projects that help us to do things mm -hmm. better. And they involve people from all cells. Um, so like e every time, so there, there's when you do have capacity to produce things that are not necessarily client projects, then we make sure there's things to do that help us to be a better company or have a better infrastructure or, 
and and those are open for everyone and and some of them end up uh, in our in our client side or in our client's sure. plate because we we just like capture problems from real projects or we've captured capture problems from real firms and then like store them very preciously in our support projects uh, queue and then address them uh, and and some of them come to life and we do have one that will hopefully come to life in in a month or so uh, which is an open source detail library mm -hmm. um, that will allow at least people to start from an existing detail um, instead of I don't know, looking into older projects or into detail level and details that are like common to pretty much everyone that builds in the United States. Um, so like why having separate details in separate firms that all look yeah. the same, that all try to comply with certain codes um, and just have having a small portion of that, like kind of as a GitHub repository uh, and have them upload one time and have everyone in the world uh, that needs that and, and like it would be a major gain of efficiency uh, worldwide. So but like, no, that is something that we definitely need to learn also as an industry is sharing yeah. more, it's just being much more open. Yeah. We had this conversation, right. this is for the people before yeah. we engaged into this pod podcast episode, like really, really really being open and, and sharing. Like Stack, overflow. Uh, we had Stack over, overflow for architects, right? Like something like that, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, like we, we we do have that internally, like as a as a blog, I think we use the same platform as, as Dynamo and Rhino. Uh, it's called um, Discord. Oh yeah, yeah, Discord. Uh, we do have that internally and have thought about just like open sourcing it, but we haven't decided yet. But just like having a place in which we can chat about real challenges and have people chime in and share what they've experienced. And and the magic there is that the real added value for architects comes to play because you're not focusing anymore on the detailing or the, the repetitive tasks, but whether how you design better your building because you have more time and room created for the real val value added of our profession. So this episode is made possible with support from Avail. Along with their newly released Revit application version management, AEC software company Avail has added another powerful new workflow feature called Palettes to its suite of content management capabilities. Palettes are user customized lists of content in Avail and can function as a favorites list, as starter content for a specific project, or to drive workflows such as redlining construction details. Customers administrators can add palettes to their accounts through the Avail Manage Portal page today. Interested in seeing palettes in action first? Request a demo at getavail.com slash request dash demo. Avail helps AECO firms better manage, organize, and navigate information faster. My thanks to Avail for supporting this episode of the Troxel podcast. And now let's return to the conversation. I think one of the things that's come up so many times on this show and in my own experience, and I, I would love to hear what your experience in this as well, but the idea of standards and protocols and workflows that are predefined, a lot of people see those as handcuffs. They don't see that as freedom, right? And so you, and it's a perception thing. It's just, it's just how do you perceive that? Do you see those things as handcuffs like oh now they're forcing me to do it this way because i think one of one of the things that you have to recognize in the type of work that we do which you could put under the category the broad category of knowledge okay. work right we're we're sitting at computers i mean you're you're thinking in abstract ways you're connecting dots you're building things you're you're building things i'm putting up my air quotes like you're drawing you're building models you're you're creating drawings and but you're doing knowledge work and everybody who is doing not like the big shift from blue collar to white collar work is that now everybody's responsible to figure it out yes. as they go. There's no there gone are the workflows gone are the protocols gone are the standards. There's like this factor that we have to deal with, which is that everybody is basically forced to figure things 
as they go along, figure things out as they go along. So they're turning to the internet. They're, you know, and, and the internet's fantastic. And it's also a big problem, right? Because right. you can learn 18 different ways to do a thing and you don't have time for 18 different ways. You have time for one. How do you know it's the right one? And so now we're picking and choosing and putting all of these things together in really weird ways, right? Because people are under pressure to get things done and so and, and they don't have the tools to do it. So they go looking for them on their own because they are incentivized. It's like the only option, right, is to figure this out yourself because I don't want to let anybody know that I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm not going to call the person who's the expert and reveal my myself, yeah, my, my lack of skills to them. Sure. No, I'm going to show up with, like, I figured it out. And so we take yeah. shortcuts and we're incentivized to go down the wrong pathways, right? And And these are the things that, like, every firm is dealing with this stuff. And you're talking about a repository of knowledge and you're talking about capturing knowledge and you're talking about sharing it. And it's like, we're all of this knowledge is so decentralized already, right? There's forums all over the place. There's email newsletters all over the place. There's YouTube videos. There's, there's all of these different pockets of little tiny bits of information. And there's no like architectural profession repository. And that's kind of yeah. what you need. You need something at scale that is the single source of truth. And it's like a detail library that's open source. Great. And does it work where you, you have to, it's like the, the disclaimer we see on all the AI stuff. It's like, sometimes it hallucinates. Yeah. You need to verify this. Like it's going to be the same with your detail library, right? Even though AI is not drawing your details, but you need to verify that it's, you still need to do your due diligence as a licensed True. professional to protect the health, safety, and welfare of people to verify that it's actually going to work there. But, but, and yet this thing doesn't exist that you're talking about. There's no like national or, you know, worldwide global organization for us to do well, this I, stuff. And we're fighting against these incentives to do, figure it every single day, every true. single hour. Um, what I think, and going back to the beginning of our conversation, is it's always a people problem rather than, or a mindset people problem rather than a um, the tool itself, as we were talking at the mm -hmm. beginning. Um, and I think the first big step that we need to take as as, as a group uh, or as an industry is being much more open about our misses and about our wins and then sharing them. Um, I, I I think there's a lot of, uh, of of people being scared of what you what you're saying of. of this fear of I don't know what I should be knowing and what Mary was saying is absolutely true like building buildings is incredibly complex and it's totally right if you don't know even if you have 20 and 30 years of experience it's totally okay to not know um, and by the way probably you won't could you you still won't know everything because that go back to the beginning of our conversation where it's impossible to know everything. Right. Um, but but the, there is, I believe there is some things that should be given. Um, and going back, Evan, to, to your standards question, um, which, I mean, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating topic. And, and it's a very delicate balancing act because you want to, provide some clarity on some things, but you don't want to over it, over standardize mm -hmm. it. Because every time you change one thing, there's a new standard and you don't want to end up yeah. with thousands. Right. Um, but but the, you, you just made a point, which is the AEC is an ad hocracy. <laughs> and we do things ad hoc. I've never heard that term before. That's great. <laughs> It is. But it is, True. so every time we need to do and And there is, there is some, something good about that, which is you are flexible, you're versatile, and you can just, like, create things on the go. Um, and I think that, that that's, that's uh, um, an essence very representative of, of Slanty somehow. But there is, a, there is a downside, which is you're you're spending time on things that you shouldn't be spending on. And even if you know how to do them and, and, and you do have the skill set, 
you're you're not spending time on other things and other initiatives which will have a bigger impact so like low com like high complexity low impact uh, you shouldn't be spending much time on those and we should try to like to find a way to create a base for you to work on top of right. that like i'm not saying uh, go get a detail library and don't think and talk to the chat GPT detail library and let her or him, I don't know Maybe. her genders, <laughs> they gender, um, give you the proper detail. But, but rather than like build your critical thinking and spirit and, and like even understand that you don't have to create some things from scratch. Because if you are, you're not spending your precious time on other things, which could have a bigger impact on the project. So like, I think like building, so building open source projects or, or common data sources of truth is definitely one thing we need to embrace as an industry. And on the other hand, just like building the critical mindset or spirit of people uh, to question things that do work right now, but may not work with a new generation, more um, software re-oriented or tech technologically oriented, saying like, I'm not going to do this. Right. Um, so like, I think it's both things on the same time because you don't want to have a single so source of truth and people using it without critically thinking right. about it. Totally. Right. And, and you don't want to have people critically thinking about things that everybody is doing at the same time in different desks. Yep. Yes. And, and something else about the standards is um, that it, it's um, really connected to what we are talking about is if um, what you are saying is so true that there are online 18 different options for doing uh, a single thing. And then someone at your organization maybe took the time to really study and understanding that those eight, those eighteen options, and then figuring out okay, this one is the best one. And uh, if we are not, and we use this uh, metaphor metaphor a lot in Slantis, is if we are not learning at the pace of everyone, then no one is learning. Meaning that if you did that research and and you share it and we have the commitment as an organization to create the systems for people to reach out to the, that information on an easy way, even easier than Googling it, which is a challenge. Uh, but having the systems really available so people can figure out faster which one of those 18 options is the best one because somebody else already did it. And then you don't have to go through that. Uh, yourself and you are learning on the pace of others doing their research before. So it's kind of like stepping on other uh, other people's shoulders of knowledge already and and using that to build your own as you go. And I think we we are we are at a lack in uh, of that in our industry. Like we are not putting mm -hmm. knowledge and information yeah. at the center. And that is costing us to reinvent the, yeah. the wheel every time. For sure. Yeah. And on the standards vein, so um, our, our BIM strategy team, I'm going to say hi to our BIM strategy team from here. <laughs> and, and they do, so they do, they call themselves uh, the Marie Kondos of BIM. Ooh. And I find that hilarious. <laughs> and I found, <laughs> and I love it. And, and, um, I, like I think they've created a, a very um, useful like thumb rule for standards uh, on Marie Kondo's inspiration. Like if it doesn't spark joy, just like Get rid of it. throw it Get away. It. Yeah. So <laughs> I think that's a bit like a standard is something like very complex to create and that you need to revisit very frequently and that it takes a lot of there's, time. There's there's um, there's been so much time and attention put into things that are bad that we feel like that we yeah. have to use those oh, because yeah. of that that all of the resources that we've sunk into that thing mm -hmm. and to your point like i mean mm -hmm. it takes a it takes some critical thinking to really weigh whether that is useful or not valuable yeah. or not productive or not and if it's not just get rid of it like just 
throw it out. Don't worry about your sunk costs anymore. It's actually costing you more and more and more. It's not helping you more and more and more, which is what it should be doing. Yeah, totally. There, there's this totally. idea yeah. of, of, I mean, this, this is coming up time and time again in this conversation, but, you know, the, because of what I was talking about earlier, where everybody's kind of left to their own devices to figure things out and the lack of quality information sitting at the center, we cannot measure yes. productivity in these businesses. It is impossible to, to actually measure productivity, right? Because if it's left to everybody to figure this out as they go and they're looking at 18 different ways or they can only find a couple and they, they, they slam these concoctions together to just to solve today's problem, not and it, and I'm sure as people who are deep, deep, deep in technology and BIM like you are, you see this all the time where we, what, what's the way that people say this? They sacrifice the future for today, right? They, sacri they, they build incredible technical debt today and not thinking about tomorrow or next week or two years from now because it solves the problem of today. With the things that you're talking totally. about putting in place and having a dedication to that really changes the game. And I'm and I, I can totally understand that when you talk to firms about this, they would get excited about that. But when the rubber meets the road, it takes a dedication from everybody on that team to totally. live that in perpetuity. And that's when things get really hard, right? Because it's like, this sounds great. And I can practice meditation for a week. But in a month, I won't be doing meditation anymore because it's hard. Like, and, and I mean, just, just to use that as an analogy, right? You're talking about doing this in perpetuity. You're talking about getting serious about it and sticking with it. And that is, is a really hard part because architects are all trained to do it on their own. And I think yes. that learned behavior is so rooted in our, in our wiring that that is really hard to overcome. Yeah. I think we are we are uh, fighting a very very long tradition of how buildings are being made, like since the pyramids. Like there's a lot of things that still remain in the way we do things that we need to rethink. Um, you were talking about the knowledge or a knowledge based business, and we are on the knowledge age, but we still operate as a revolution or industrial revolution age in our business so meaning that we are uh through like we are moving our project through different stages on a linear 4t system rather than a fully integrated system and that is great part of the dysfunction of what we are seeing uh through a profession um the other thing that you were talking about is and we've been over and over this discussion and it's related to the model that we're using industrial revolution versus knowledge based era um the hours how are we measuring hours and how we're charging hours and actually we're trying to do things smarter smarter and faster and that should take less hours yeah. um, you're and yeah, I'm, you, I'm you sure get paid by the hour it's really hard to i mean so so yes. projects the less time you spend on a project the better it's not better for the project. It's it's better for the bottom line, right? But at the same time, like hours are not there. You can't measure productivity by bu by people being busy because hours it equates to busyness, right? And and so again, yes. like the Model T example, you measure output of cars on the assembly line. That's what yeah. you're measuring, and you're trying to figure out ways to get more cars out faster. If that's the business model, right? With us. Exactly. It's, it, it isn't like that, right? It, you, you, we can't measure productivity by how many emails you send, right? That, that doesn't make any yes. sense at all. If you're spending all day fielding emails and Slack messages and Teams messages and video calls and doing, you're actually not working at all, right? You're just, you're talking, you're coordinating, you're doing, and you're spending hours, valuable, like super, super high value hours doing things you abs that are absolutely not contributing mostly not contributing to the bottom line and and this whole idea of misalignment between the work we do and the business the health of the business like that those two things are not in alignment at all we just equate busy to productive and that's not the case 
Yeah. You know? And and like from a mindset mindset standpoint, like what we've seen through a lot of the of clients that we work with is the hours just constrains your mind into thinking in hours, which is a whole problem because it's um it's um count like it's it's not being as productive as it should be in the end for uh crazy as it sounds because uh if you're only thinking hours your head is really being narrowed down into those hours instead of thinking okay what if i release myself from this hour mindset and figure out i need to invest my time in harvesting knowledge that it's going to end up uh, recycling all the information that we created but uh, as you were saying before, we're sacrificing that because our our mindset it's only seeing a really small portion and it's thinking uh, in in smaller pieces rather than zooming yeah. out and seeing the macro. Yeah, and then it's also so this is a, a something we we struggle with and and a big challenge um, because we do develop projects but we do charge by the hour. For some mm -hmm. clients, so you have a whole structure working on an hourly mm -hmm. basis, and like I've I've went into this battle thousands of times, and it's my <laughs> daily battle, and I will keep going. But but you do have a uh, five hundred, seven hundred thousand people company that count hours, and then you gotta adapt to whatever the system they have, and and it, and it's hard to to go back and then if you sure. go on an hourly basis and you decrease the amount of hours that takes your team to produce something then it is unfair mm -hmm. and it's and it's the wrong incentive like not only for for the people but for the firm too because you're you're thinking on a on a commoditization mindset rather than a an, an added value and our profession should be about added value so 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 it is a a huge challenge and a mindset that I think it would take ages to change um, and, and to really understand like what what measurement units are we going to pick to measure productivity on developing a project and it's not only going to be the amount of hours it takes you to produce a project that may be a factor or a variable but then what about the amount of RFIs you get a year later because of producing fast and stealing happiness from the future. <laughs> right. So like that's not being count. Right. And and so so it is a complex problem, like a really wicked problem to solve and, and no one has solved it yet. And we, we have it a shot. But we had this conversation, like we, we have a, a few people that do uh, advisory for us uh, on board level. We are the major, like we are the only and, and major owners of, of Slantis, but then we have a few people that help us on a board level um, uh, just to think better about the business. And we started Slantis very early on in our career. So it's been rolling for almost a decade now, but we started when we were like 25. So we were very young. And... Um, key thing there is surrounding yourself with people that know more than you do. <laughs> um, and um, from the very early days, we were fighting against this hour thing. And I would say that that was certainly one of the uh, mayor's aha moments. Like we're not counting hours at all. This is limiting our ability to see beyond. And we rolled until we were, we were almost like 20 employees there. And we were fighting every board meeting that we were having. Like our advisor is having a lot of experience, uh, a lot of these people from coming from the um, uh, US uh, AC industry is like, you need to start counting hours because this is going to go bananas on your uh, business, business wise. And we're like, we're not doing this, but at a certain point, like the scale, um, like kind of constraints you of figuring out how to do it in a better way. And we are really aware that this is not the correct way. But if you're a service business, you're usually replicating the structure of your partner. So what we, what happened was we were saying we're not counting hours. Uh, you just see the end product of our projects and how fast we're producing this. And then our clients were like, okay, and where's your hour timesheet? Because we need to charge this to our own clients. Mm -hmm. And at some point, like it was 
uh, it was yeah. like different roads from what we tried to accomplish to what we were seeing on the market. Yeah. And what <laughs> I'm not against counting hours. I'm against measuring productivity with with that variable as as the only yeah. one. And guess that that's a standard right. in a, in a, in our industry. Right. So it is. so like I think like it's not it's not about the hour count. Um it's not about the hour count. It's about it's about siloing your capacity to think on a broader spectrum on on what it takes to build a project. So like it's it's very narrow minded to to think that the productivity of a project can be measured only by counting the hour of people that produced that or, or worked on that. Um, and it's not representative of, of the level of work that a project entails. Especially when technology gets um, involved, right? Because tech, the whole point the whole point of these tools is to, I mean, it, just take automation as an example, right? Automation is to take something that used to take X number of amount of time and squash it down into a, a very tiny fraction of that. So what, if you charge by the hour, then what do you do? I mean, and, and this starts, I mean, this really points out the value of these things and what they encapsulate, right? So if you've, if you've been able to codify your knowledge into an algorithm that can automate something away, there's value there, right? I mean, this is the, to everybody listening to this podcast totally gets this. And, and yet yes. there's still this, well, they're scared that architects architects aren't going to be around because AI is going to do everything in a fraction of the time and who would ever go to an architect? And it's like the value, like we are encoding the value into that, into the, the, what yeah. comes back, what we're receiving out of these systems, whatever they are. I mean, if even talking about your knowledge management and talking about your repository of information, like that's your knowledge encapsulated and codified to help the next generation or the next team do something better mm -hmm. and hopefully faster and with less pain where they where they can shift that their their new time to even better value so that they can deliver an exceptional product at the end of the day right and it's just like that those shifts is what we're actually talking about we're not talking about taking everything and compressing it down to nothing we're not talking about productivity we're not talking about efficiency we're talking about doing this so that we can deliver value, which is like if architecture can change the world, if we really can have a huge impact, that has to happen, right? Like yeah. dull buildings, boring buildings, repetitive, literal crap that gets built every single day is not adding value to people's lives. Like, and, that, and if we want, like that's the commodity argument that you were making earlier right it's it just in the physical form of it it's the physical form of the commodity it's like bill we don't want to commoditize our value into commodity buildings we want to produce architecture not not every building needs to be architecture capital a architecture but we do have the ability to affect the daily lives of everybody on the planet and that's where our value needs to shift away so stop doing the, the the literal crap that you're doing because it's valueless right that you're you're doing that over and over again these are these are the same same conversations i mean it, it's it it and to your point like talking about it to a firm that is in, has a history of this is the way we've always done it this is there it's so difficult to change i mean i i do have an affection for people who try to start their own thing and try to do a different business model because they can. It's a clean slate, right? It, it's a design problem that deserves right, right. some attention. But to hear that it gets pulled back because you're trying to swim against a really strong current is, I mean, yes. that's, that's heartbreaking. <laughs> I'll just say it. It's, hard, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> you have strong arms to keep yeah, swimming. So. Right. <laughs> Right. Um, I I do believe also, and 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 also to your point, like this is an incredibly complex problem. Like yes. every time we have conversations with a lot of people that are like-minded and really understand certain aspects of the problem, 
uh, the conclusion for us, it, it, it's an incredibly complex problem that tackles a lot of different fronts that are usually open and, and, and open-ended, let's say, and, and don't have a straight answer. Um, what, what I think um, we can contribute at least is doing this type of things in uh, raising awareness and uh, just being part of the buzz on the conversation that something needs to change. I think that there's still a lot of people that haven't realized that things need to change <laughs> and that makes the current stronger. Um, so if we can at least um, raise awareness of there's a different way of doing things or um, and that could be better for you and for everyone and in, in the end for the community that's a major step um, and the other thing that I was thinking while you while you were talking is um, there's there's and I continue to stress on this because there is a lot we need to learn from the people side and just call it soft skills. I think it's much bigger than just soft skills uh, in order to be better at what we do. And our profession is incredibly collaborative. Like there's no way you can produce in a, a, a building with a capital A architecture if that team was not uh, composed by amazing talented architects and how they collaborated is like the architect, the, architectural piece is uh, the end product of that collaboration. Um, I think that starts from leadership and that starts from being open-minded and just being aware that uh, people are the center of it all. Like there's no way you can deliver amazing things if you don't have amazing people on your team and you teach them how to collaborate in the most efficient way. And then kind of like even the hourly conversation goes into a second plane because the power of the team is so much bigger. Yeah. Um, so people people at the center of it all, for us, is kind of like even a motto for us. Uh, and we've invested and we continue to invest like crazy amounts of money in uh, learning and teaching and collaboration. And this morning we had a, like a two-hour feedback uh, workshop on how to give and how to receive feedback on, properly. And those things are critical in order to understand how you do things mm -hmm. better. Um, and it, it's, it's so, it's so obvious and it's at plain sight, but, but just project deadlines yeah. and, uh, sure. the focus is not there. And we're, so uh, at this stage we're thinking, so we internally have a, pretty unique way of collaborating, um, not only uh, developing a specific project for a client, but developing a internal project for Slantis or just like collaboration, like intercell collaborations, intercellular collaboration mm -hmm. among our different cells or different teams. Um, what we're thinking right now is how to extend that collaboration through the whole community mm -hmm. and how to help other people um, embrace collaboration the way we do. So kind of trying to decode the principles that got us here and allow us to collaborate and allow us to do things that are impossible to be done alone, but possible to be done within a perfect, let's say like plasticity of collaboration and how we can um, extend that outside what's our Slantis team and what's outside our Slantis community and like hopefully get everyone in the AEC just embrace collaboration on a deeper level. Um, it's yeah. very inspirational and I don't say that lightly because one one thing that I think I see as a, a I don't want to say it's a trend but I see this trait this character trait in a lot of people who come on this show which and you said it early on, Andy. You had this global perspective, this global interest, and I don't think of that just as like yeah. the globe. I think of that as our profession, yeah. as it spans the globe. And what you're talking about here is bringing those people closer together, right? And because that's where the the talent truly is. And and so it, what you're talking about is truly inspiring because you really are stepping back 
and having that very wide perspective of how can we help this all get better, where a lot of firms are in the position of it's all about us it, and us meaning the firm, right? And when you say it's all about us, you're thinking of like the global profession, the global industry, right? And and so this to me is, it, it truly is inspirational because you have this perspective that is so different than, fir firms have a really hard time going from working on projects to working on the profession. And, and I think consulting firms like yourselves, like service firms, there, there's several out there, right? Where you, you just get this bigger picture and you want to help it all get better. And that to me is, is, uh, I mean, it's noteworthy. It's remarkable actually. So I, I appreciate what you're Thank doing you. and, and I appreciate that you put yourselves out there and I hope that being on this show will just help that happen even more for you because you guys are, I mean, you, you truly are walking the talk, you know, you're not just talking about it. You're actually walking the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I heard once, I don't, I don't remember exactly where, but, um, uh, when, when, um, people that start companies talk about purpose and, um, I heard once they said like a hint to know what your purpose is, is it's never about, it's never about you. It's always about helping others. And true greatness or true success comes from the impact and the true uh, change you generate uh, on those around you and those who are impacted by what you're doing. So uh, we are really, really aware of that and try to do it from every possible perspective that the company allows us to. Um, so thank you also for uh, bringing us into the show and just uh, helping us spread a bit more of our impact. <laughs> yeah, and hope we can help you too. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Well, give everybody uh, a place where they can go online to learn more about you, get in touch with you, things like that. Uh, so slantis.com, uh, you can check our website there or uh, our LinkedIn page, a company page, Slantis. It's really active and you can um, just share, see what we share from a culture perspective and lessons learned. We share a lot. Um, yeah. So website, slantis.com and LinkedIn page. Uh, Slantis. Great. Well, I will Thank have you. links to that cool. and to connect with you both on LinkedIn as well in the show notes for yeah. this episode. Yeah. So thank you. It's been a great conversation. Thanks, Thank Ivan. It was fun. Totally. <laughs>